Peace. Uh, today's mathematics is wisdom culture, which represents the number two, wisdom, and four, culture, and the 24th letter in our alphabet is X, which represents the unknown in mathematics. So I wanted to build about that relationship between the unknown and wisdom culture, as well as intersectionality, because when you look at the letter X, it's literally two intersecting lines. So intersectionality and understanding what it is can give us some perspective about that relationship between the unknown and wisdom culture. I mentioned briefly in a recent video that I now co-teach on a collegiate level at the local university in the political science department. And the course is about organizing and advocating for justice. So in today's class, we dealt more with the science of environmental justice. And we had some guest speakers come in to speak about the work that they've been doing in that space. One of the guest speakers was Jim Morris, who is an investigative journalist by trade. He founded Public Health Watch, which is a nonprofit that raises awareness about environmental issues impacting communities, as well as he published a recent book called The Cancer Factory. We also had Luella Kenny, who was a resident of Love Canal, which was a community that suffered one of the single largest chemical disasters in the history of this country. And we had a few other people come in and speak about the work that they're also doing in that space of environmental justice. Jim Morris talked more specifically about his book, The Cancer Factory, and it deals with occupational exposure to carcinogenic chemicals. In other words, people working in factories, being exposed to chemicals that have caused various different forms of cancer, and how they in turn expose their own families to this type of cancer because it's carcinogenic and how it has actually impacted not only their families and communities where these factories actually exist as well as what has been the government and corporate response to knowing knowing about this type of exposure and the health disparities that it has created amongst people who have worked there as well as their families we also talked more specifically about Love Canal and that chemical disaster that actually occurred. Now, if you don't know anything about Love Canal, definitely Google Love Canal and you're going to see countless articles, interviews, videos, books, documentaries about Love Canal because it was because of Love Canal that Congress passed the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, known as super funds through the Environmental Protection Agency. So it was that much of a disaster that Congress passed an act related directly to that when it came to the residents that lived in Love Canal. So when you're doing the research, one of the things that you're going to learn is central to that advocacy of getting that act of Congress passed was a homeowners organization that got legal representation to advocate on behalf of the residents that lived in Love Canal. One of the things that is going to be unknown that you're not really going to come across too much information about is that there were two communities that lived in Love Canal. You had the homeowners who organized and had the legal representation to get the act of Congress passed that were primarily white and you had renters or tenants that lived in a community known as Griffin Manor that were primarily black. And these black community members were not included in the advocacy or the organizing of the homeowners to get this act of Congress passed. So they were completely left out in terms of representation, even though they were equally impacted by this large scale chemical disaster. So when you're doing this research, you're not going to learn much about the concerned Love Canal Renters Association that was established by black people in Griffin Manor. Primarily by three black women, Agnes Jones, Vera Starks, and Elena Thornton, who came together to organize the black residents that lived in Griffin Manor to have some form of representation when it came to this large scale disaster that to this day are still impacted and have not received justice even though they also were equally impacted from this large scale disaster known as Love Canal. Now, when people look at this history of Love Canal, they just look at it through the lens of 
environmental justice. <clears throat> they don't consider that intersectionality of racism that was actually present that occurred when it came to the advocacy and organizing with that entire community. They also don't look at the intersectionality of classism. But you, because you had homeowners that didn't look at themselves the same as renters or tenants. And that's something that's important to take in consideration when we're looking at anything that you have to be able to consider the lens of intersectionality. Because if you're not looking at these various different things that could be intersecting, you're going to miss a lot of the things that actually occurred. There's going to be a lot of things that are unknown to you. It's important to keep in mind that just because you have people that may advocate for environmentalism or they may be environmental justice warriors it doesn't mean that they're not also sexist or misogynist you may have people who are anti-racist and they're like modern day abolitionists just because they have that type of stance it does not mean that they're not completely ignorant to environmental issues and their impact in the local ecosystem. There are things that can simultaneously exist and that's the importance of understanding intersectionality. Because you can have some people who are, they all about the environment, but they racist as hell. You have some people that can be all about uh, collective work and responsibility and identity politics when it comes to black people, but they misogynist as hell. They don't really like women. But if you're not considering that intersectionality, there's going to be a lot of things that are unknown to you. So how do you make the unknown known? You have to discern culture. That's what wisdom culture is. You have to approach culture from the perspective of recognizing that people have different lived experiences. And even though they may be equally impacted by something, that they may come from two totally different places when it comes to what is actually impacting all of them. When you think about that disaster that happened in Love Canal, that to this day are still impacting people today, everybody in that community was impacted. It didn't matter if people owned homes or they were renting homes. All of them had family members that died, family members that were affected physically as well as emotionally, as well as psychologically from being exposed to those type of chemicals. It didn't matter what race they were. It didn't matter what age they were. It didn't matter what their class was. Everybody was equally impacted. But when you have other different things going on that are intersections, sometimes as a whole, people may not advocate for a common cause because they're looking at each other as different. And when that happens, sometimes you may not have the important critical mass of people advocating for a common cause because they're not looking at each other as having common issues. Approaching culture from a wise perspective or looking at the lived experiences of various different people you're able to have more of an ability to come together for a common cause because you recognize that you all have very just different type of issues that are going on. That's common. And that's one of the things that didn't happen when it came to that large scale disaster at Love Canal. You had community members that was looking at each other as different. So because of that, you didn't have the critical mass of advocacy of community coming together in order to solve that type of issue that happened with that large scale disaster. You had some communities trying to get what they can for themselves and you had others that was left out. And you see it happening all at a time. But when you consider the intersectionality of things that you could have various different things going on, you also have the ability to address the things that you can actually see because you can't address the unknown because you don't know. But as long as you're able to make the unknown known, now you have the wisdom to deal with things when it comes to 
the culture that is actually happening and positively affect the culture if it's toxic. So I will that this was inspiring, it was empowering, it was educational. It just gave those of you just a brief example of the relationship of making the unknown known through understanding intersectionality that gives you a sense of wisdom when it comes to exposing the cultural dynamics that are actually going on. It's all interconnected. And if we're not looking at some things through that lens of intersectionality, we're going to miss some things. They're going to be things that are just simply going to be unknown to us. So if it's unknown and we don't have that knowledge, how are we going to have the wisdom to properly assess a culture? Whether that is a culture that is within our household, whether that is the cultural environment of our workplace, whether that is the culture of our community, we won't have the capacity to be able to address it because the unknown ain't known. But sometimes we can make it known by seeing those dots that are connected or those different type of intersections of multiple things that can actually be going on simultaneously. So. Peace.